Good morning, good morning, good morning, everybody, or good afternoon. Listen, it's Joel Simmons back again for It Starts With Me. All right, so I've got an opportunity to meet our next guest just for a few moments, but I'm already, like, loving this guy. He's got a great attitude, got a great spirit about him, and I think you'll be excited to meet up with him. There's going to be a lot of things that we're going to learn. We're going to learn about his story. And it's just going to be, I have a feeling it's going to be a great episode. So just get ready for that. All right, listen, let's clear the board. Make sure everything's out in the open. It starts with me. Podcast happens every single Wednesday, 1230, right? So we need you to just jump on in there. We need you to subscribe, follow, like, love. Be a part of the It Starts With Me community, all right? So get in there. 1230 every Wednesday Eastern. All right. Also, remember this, that my buddy, Michael Seville, co-host of Community Beacon, is running his show every single Monday at nine o'clock. Motivational Mike Monday. All right. So make sure you're there and watch his show. Participate. It's a beautiful thing. All right. And then last, every single Friday, we're going to be back again for the Community Beacon. And this is a place where we want to share and shed light onto different things. We want to bring about truth so that many people all over are able to feel and see something new inside their lives. And hopefully this will add to their ability to gain liberty in whatever they are doing, whatever they're going through. All right. So anyway, I want to get back to this show because I have a feeling this is going to be a really good show. We have with us here today, and I'm going to attempt this one more time. I've only I've only tried it twice. Oyinye Njindu. Oyinye Njindu. I think that I got it right, but he'll he'll let me know. He is the business owner of Core Development. He's he, he's uh, right in Nevada, and what he wants to do, the reason why he jumped on the show is because he wanted to share a little bit more about his talk and talk a little bit more about his M.E., money experience, the book that he created about how he made it from zero. He's got a great story to tell. So I'm interested in hearing about this story as well. He also goes by the name of KC. So KC is a real estate investor, an author, and currently the number one selling book on Amazon in personal finance and money. That's interesting. Love it. He's also an aspiring, motivational, an inspirational speaker with a goal. Check this goal out. I love this goal. To one day deliver a seminar to over 1 million people live. And in this day and age, you can absolutely do it. I mean, with just going before people live, you can do this. You can do this. I don't know if all of them will be actually inside the facility, but hey, you know what? Build a football stadium somewhere. It can be done. You know what I'm saying? Anyway, to your front, we bring to you now, KC. What's going on, KC? How are you doing today, buddy? Hey, Joe. How you doing, sir? All is well. All is well, man. So glad to have you on the show. First off, did I get your name right that third time? That was the third time I said it. Believe it or not, you nailed it out the park. It was, it was a home yes. run. <laughs> that was a beautiful home run. I love it. <laughs> All right. Awesome, man. Awesome. I love it, man. I love your zeal. I love your smile. I love the way you just kind of like get in it. And I love the way that in seconds we were just like talking like we have known each other for years. What's going on, man? How are you doing this week? Uh, It's been a wonderful week, Joe. Um, It started off with, you know, me having the opportunity to really kind of meet with some of my partners, talk to some investors and you know, we have some great, wonderful things planned for this week. And, you know, this year, this year, 2022 mm-hmm. is our year. I like it. So when you're talking with your investors, you know, you're preparing what kind of stuff? I mean, what in this real estate, what are you doing? Are you renting? Are you buying, flipping? Are you working the, the burr? What, what's going on? 
That's actually a wonderful question. So right now what we're doing is we're focused on affordable housing in the Texas market for the low to medium, uh, low income house families, as well as the homeless and the veterans. Uh, so what we're looking to do is to provide tiny homes. I know it's a new phenomenon that a lot of people are still getting used to. Uh, it's big in Australia, it's big in other countries, but we're trying to bring that here to the United States. And these homes are between 450 square feet to around 750 square feet. Our goal again is to help the uh, homelessness. Uh, we noticed that since the pandemic, a lot of people lost the ability to have a home, a roof over their head. And that's kind of what we would like to do is help these folks have somewhere to stay, as well as also work with the city to ensure that with the inflation, with things being so expensive, that there are families out there that don't get, that they might be priced out of their homes, but they still have somewhere to stay. And that's our focus. That's powerful. This is a really big thing. And this is something that is absolutely necessary right now in the States. I'm, you know, I can only imagine everywhere else because I think that this is a global issue. In the States, we have a big concern with what's called tent city growing in different uh, states and different parts of our country. Have you had to deal with anything like that? Absolutely. And actually, what's our, what's amazing about this is we're going to be doing what we call a tiny home community. Uh, the goal between behind the tiny home community is to put these houses, these tiny homes, but also to put manufacturing plants within a 10 mile radius of these tiny home communities. And believe it or not, the focus is to give these homeless individuals and these veterans, uh, as well as these lower income families, a chance to actually have employment. So the priority employer employment focus will be for these low income households, as well as these homeless folks to have somewhere to work, to actually have the chance to build their own homes as well. So it works hand in hand to keep, you know, economy moving, but it also allows to kind of short, shorten that wealth gap that we're kind of experiencing here in the United States. Wow. That's, this is, this is, this is big, right? Absolutely. This is huge. But can you name any of your investors or? Uh, I could give some information, uh, but, you know, I can't go into too much detail, but 4H Concept, yeah, 4H Concept is who one of the folks that we're working with. Okay, um, big. Yeah, so 4H Concept, uh, we're also working with a company out of Las Vegas, Nevada, as well, uh, that is, they're called TavitanCorp.net. So Tavitan Corp, they've done a lot of uh, development deals in the Las Vegas and the California area. And that was the original focus was to kind of help. Uh, I don't know if you know too much about the boat housing. So there was been, there's been a boat housing crisis in California, especially in the Bay Area, where the mm. wealthy folks are kind of upset with the fact that a lot of people can afford homes in the Bay Area, so they're living on boats on the water. So what that's mm -hmm. doing is that's making the water, uh, it's making it kind of unattractive for those you know, wealthier individuals. They don't like to come out and see someone's whole entire life in front of their house. You know, So what they've complained to the city, so what the city has done is it's actually led into these tent communities like you mentioned, but sometimes that tent community doesn't really have enough infrastructure to manage some of these individuals. And a lot of them are employed. So what that has done is that has made people move into the south southern cities because the southern states are cheaper um, mm -hmm. to live in. And that has also then caused uh, a boom in our housing market. Well, with that also comes higher taxes and you know much more higher cost of living. So we have those individuals who are currently who have been residing in Texas for a long time now find themselves priced out of their homes. So that's why we decided to come up with a strategy that would help these folks to have somewhere to stay, also give them a chance to, you know, have employment for those who lost their jobs to the pandemic as well. Wow. Wow. This is huge. I mean, I, I got like two, I got two or three more questions for you just in regards to this, because this is really interesting. This this hit me hard when I went out to LA just last month. I was out there for about a week. We had a program going on and I took my mother with me. And it was a great time. We had a great time. But one thing that we had to drive through in order to get where we were going was Skid Row. And going through Skid Row or quote unquote tent city, you know, I found out so much and it was almost, I just could not believe it because it, it's like during a certain point in time through hours in the night, 
you there is no real law that can be upheld to move somebody out of the way so that area i don't know what could happen if you were walking down skid row it was such a vast amount of area and you cannot tell anyone to evacuate they have they have the the, the rule of the road uh, overnight so i guess my question for you is with the program that you're you're developing with your investors and the rest of your team are you particularly since one of your aspirations is to be a motivational inspirational speaker are you going to be delivering some of the keynotes to these individuals that will help give them the new mindset to move into your programs absolutely and that's a great question joe because at the end of the day it does start with the mindset uh, a lot of people you know people don't necessarily come and ask for help unfortunately that's kind of one of the downfalls of humanity but with the empathy that we have, we look at these situations and we say, what can we do? How can we make it where there isn't a stigma behind actually asking for help, right? Because most people look at it and say, if I have to ask for someone to help me, then it might devalue myself to myself. And I love I love your show, Joe. I love the fact that the name of your show stays it starts with me. And that's the that's something so important because a lot of people don't have that thought process. They see it as somebody else is responsible for what's going on. You know, we just talked about this California. You mentioned your experience. And, you know, believe it or not, that experience is something that is going on so much right now that even it's now starting to trickle down to states like the Texas. And we're seeing more and more homelessness in Texas because there are people who are actually experiencing things that life is hard harder for them the pandemic came in cost a lot of people to lose your jobs you know there were also individuals who you know lost their jobs due to vaccine mandates lost their jobs due to closures of businesses and now these people need help especially when it comes to housing so one of the things i would like to do with my platform when i get an opportunity to speak in front of individuals is one help change the mindset but not just changing the mindset of those that are less fortunate, but also change the mindset of those who have the ability to help and let them understand that them extending a hand to help these individuals is something that is very necessary in today's world as we have it constructed. Powerful, powerful, 100% powerful. I had a conversation recently with an individual within my workforce. And one of the suggestions that I gave, or one of the things that I kind of argued or debated was this, when developing, and this goes for any business, I would, I, I would believe, but when developing individuals, there has to be a double mentor mentoring program. And I like the way you just said that because it's not just the mindset of those that need to be helped. It's the mindset of those that are helping, Absolutely. you know? And sometimes I, I have found that the issue, the reason why we don't have somebody who still wants to help is because there was no mentorship of those that are being helped to grow into those people that will help to return it. There should be mentoring, you know, for those that are at the top, those that are at the bottom. And then remember, there's going to be someone that comes after them. So there should always be this inspiration to not only get well, but then once you are well, to help someone else become well. You know, absolutely. Absolutely. And Joe, I see myself as a connector. Right. I believe that every one of us has certain gifts and, you know, talents in life. And I believe one of my talents is to be able to connect people. And I've been blessed and fortunate to know what it's like to be on the other side. And when I say the other side, I mean the lower income side where things are rough. And now I'm in a position where I have access to people who have the capital and people who have the decision-making powers to make these changes. And my goal is to connect these people and be, if you will, uh, a medium where now they can funnel what needs, needs to be funneled down that chain to allow the people who are struggling, who are trying to have a better life for themselves, actually get some assistance, especially in the housing market. You know, when uh, I will tell you something that, you know, really always hits me. And that is when someone doesn't have a place to stay, 
when someone wonders where their next meal comes from, it's hard to give them a message. It's hard for them to understand the message. It's hard for them to see past what's going on in their lives at the present time. So being able to provide them a solution, and now you can have a solution-based conversation to change in the mindset, but without necessarily giving them an option for a solution, a lot of times our message is lost. Great point. Great point. Uh, there's a scripture in the book of James. At one point in time, it said that uh, if you notice that your brother is without warmth, instead of just saying, be thou warmed and go in peace, he said, give them also a blanket. <laughs> mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I mean, I believe that we just had this conversation on the community beacon, and it's just very important. You know, um, Maslow's hierarchy, the first stage is to actually supply those things that people are in need of. And through that, that is inspiration all by itself. Absolutely. You know? So tell me something then, uh, Casey. What has motivated you? What what was the change? What was the transition that either brought you to this or the one that I guess you were going to discuss? So my motivation is a three-part process. And I would say the most recent push was in 2019. Um, I've always had an approach that life is a level-based game, okay? And... Some people might not technically understand that, but for me, this has helped me through processes. So just to kind of give you a little synopsis as to what I mean, I grew up under some very hard times. Um, I grew up in Africa. I was born in the US, but at six months old, I had an opportunity to go back to Nigeria. And my family weren't the top level, you know, rich. I'm not an African prince. <laughs> you know, I know a lot of people hear about the African prince. No, I'm not an African <laughs> prince. I uh, I had a chance to have a good life up until 10 years old. Now, when I turned 10, I experienced a different side of life. My mom and my sister had some issues that they had to go work on. So I was put in a public boarding school, which technically doubles up as an orphanage slash boys home. And what that did for me was it showed me a different side of life. It showed me uh, the harshness of life. And I always, I make a running joke. I say, a person who gets to live in a penitentiary or who gets to live in the worst parts of the hood, if you will, here in the United States, is considered a luxury person where I, you know, in my circumstance, and I'll tell you why. I have a cousins that have moved from Africa to the US and they live in these hoods. And these people are viewed as wealthy to their families. You know, my had a cousin who there were seven of them that lived in one small bedroom. It's not a one bedroom apartment, a one small bedroom. The bedroom had, they stacked their clothes high and that was kind of what they considered um, a closet, if you will. So just bags with clothes on top of it on one side. They had a small cooker, like a little electric, not electric cooker, it was because uh, they didn't have electricity. They had a small little thing that they would add coal to cook their food in one section of that same room. And in the middle, everybody would sleep head to foot. So the parents would sleep at the ed ends and the kids would sleep head to foot. And I remember seeing there, going there one time when he had some flooding because of the way the, the houses, uh, or not the house, but the rooms were set up. You had multiple families living in these uh, houses. And I remember going in there one time they had flood and you can just see all the kids. I mean, these are seven, eight year old children putting bags on their head to avoid their clothes from getting wet. You know, where they used, consider the bathroom is a small place outside with a hole in the floor. And that's where they got to, you know, do their business and they showered outside. So there wasn't any privacy. So I got to see that. And then I came to the United States and, you know, I have a YouTube channel. I expressed some of these things the other day. And I was just saying how, even though I went through an experience of eating one meal a day in some cases. And sometimes I do something I call 101. And 101 or 101, I call that one breakfast, skip lunch and dinner, or breakfast, lunch and skip dinner. Uh, I consider myself so fortunate because I had a vehicle, I had a car, you know, I had a place to sleep. 
So for me, those things are so important that when I see how people are going through circumstances and people are, you know, going through some serious issues in life, it hits me because I understand that side. I know what it's like to be there. I know how people can be so discouraged and so um, tortured mentally when they don't have anything. You know, it's people say it starts with a thought. Yes, I agree. It does start with a thought. And the thought is what changes your approach and changes who you are. But when your circumstance just seems so bleak, it's hard for people to be able to switch that mindset and have that thought. Listen, I, I had to take... I had to take a little moment to take all that in because the truth of the matter is, is that oftentimes you'll watch a TV show or see a documentary or whatnot, and you'll hear a story like this. But for me, you know, being able to interview you right now and to hear this story and to hear you tell me this is the way your life began and to look at you and to hear the way you're speaking you know you speak so well you're very eloquent with your speech you're very knowledgeable you've got a great source of understanding and compassion gratefulness connectivity empathy you've got all these things going for you and i'm gonna tell you something because i would i would normally say this about myself people wouldn't be able to tell that's what you came from do you I ever get that? Do I do. Tell you that? do you I know, do a lot. Believe you? Yeah, absolutely. I do. You know, believe it or not, I had some friends in uh, college, and they thought I was a rich, rich kid. They always assumed that I had a family with so much money and uh, we had so much abundance. But you know, I I agreed with that sentiment simply because I believe very strongly that you are who you think you are. Right? You are not. You're not defined by your circumstance. You're not defined by what um, the world says you are. You are who you believe you are. So I accept that, and I, you know, I welcome that. When people call me Money Casey, I'm like, absolutely, I am Money Casey. You know, even when I had nothing, I was Money Casey. Mm. That's uh, that's powerful because you're talking about that's getting back to your um, your point of view again about the whole mindset and everything. So what what happened then? You know, all right. So now you're you're ten years old, and you're 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 back into the states somehow. No, no. So I'm ten years old, but I'm in Nigeria. So I'm in this uh, boarding house, if you will. It was called Federal Government College, Lori. And in that, in the school, it was considered a school, but it really doubled up as an old prison. It used to be a prisoner of war camp. Uh, wow. So we had kids that would stay there and. Uh, you know, believe it or not, it was a very tough experience. A lot of these kids, to include myself, uh, we had beatings all the time. Uh, I remember one thing that was very, um, very, I think it's a little traumatic, but, you know, I still laugh about it now. But we had this thing called general lashing. It's general lashing. So what that stood for was around 2 a.m. on random days every month, we would all get woken up. Uh, when we get woken up, we'll get, you know, lined up. There'll be a roll call. And each kid would get a beating. And the beatings would be with a stick. It would be supervised by the teachers. And the teachers would stand there and ensure that the senior students, so the oldest kids, would actually take out the beating on us. You never wanted to meet a ge miss general lashing because that means you try to escape. And it only made it worse for you. So we had to experience things like that. We had to experience, you know, I, I said something on my YouTube channel the other day. I talked about how, you know, eating a roach soup was normal because you were so hungry, uh, you had to eat whatever you could eat. You know, I'm a pretty big guy now. I weigh well north of 275 pounds. And yeah, I work out and I've been able to kind of take care of my body. But I graduated high school at 140, 146 pounds. I went into high school, you know, that boarding school at 10 years old, weighing about 205 pounds. I was a chubby kid. You know, I was lots of love in my home. And I graduated, you know, 60 pounds less than I went in. And I had that look of those kids you see on TV, like you mentioned, that have those malnourished big bellies that you're taking pictures that, you know, people are putting on the commercials and saying, help a kid out. That was me. You know, I looked that way. And now I look back at all those experiences and I understood that it was important for me to experience that because I had to be tough. I had to be strong enough 
to know that adversity comes in every level of life, right? As you grow through these levels, you have to experience adversity for you to be strong enough to handle the next level's adversity. That's that's powerful. I and I I really am hoping, especially some of some of the young men that are listening to this uh, podcast will hear that, you know, adversity comes at every level of life and you have to be strong enough to overcome or you will succumb to the adversity. My father, he always he always taught me. He said, um, if you don't stand for something, you'll fall for anything. Mm, you know, so you have to choose to be strong no matter what. Uh, no day is truly uh, no day is truly given to anyone to, you know, to excel. But every day is given to everyone to do something with it. You know, you, you have time and you have a chance. What you do with your time and what you do with your opportunity, with your chance, it really comes down to your own mindset and what you're willing to give, what you're willing to sacrifice. Uh, so you said that there was three things, right? And the first thing was level-based game. This is kind of the way you envisualize life. Like you had to make it to the next level of the game in order for you to be successful. You had to, I guess, beat this game or at least make it to a higher level to be able to continue to move forward what's the second thing the second thing is sharing right so first you have to understand it's a level based game and as you go through these levels in life you know you get to meet different people in different walks of life then the next step is to share and that sharing process involves reaching back and helping somebody else to go through their level and become a better version of themselves and you say something very important here joel and i i really love that and that is you know, speaking to the young, the young men, young women, the young people of our generation, they need this help. They need to understand that as they go through adversity in life, that they will only get stronger if they let that pain become their why as they get older. You know, there's such a high level of, you know, suicide rates going on. There's so many people who are, you know, easily discouraged. I mean, the pandemic came in and it caused a much, much larger version of depression than we've ever seen. You know, there are people that now they could have been going through a pretty good, going towards a pretty good trajectory in life, meaning, you know, ascending upwards. And then the pandemic happened and it knocked the momentum down. So with that, you have a lot of people now who are easily um, shaken. You know, there's so much negative information that is being pushed out there. And it's easy for people to get sucked into that mindset and that life. So what I want to do with my life and what I've understood my calling is, it's not just connecting people like we talked about from the wealthy to the poor, but also uplifting the people who are willing to be uplifted, who want to be able to experience the next level, who are okay with saying, hey, I passed this level of, this level of the game and I'm ready for level two. And that's kind of one of my big goals. And that's hopefully that answers your question. Huh. That's impressive. Is that part of what's inside of your book? Absolutely. So my book, my book, Money and Experience, if it's okay, I'll put a silly little plug. It's called Money and Experience, M.E. Um, it talks about the wealth equation. And I was able to come up with a simple math to be able to explain what the wealth equation is. And that's how my wealth equation is journey plus value equals yeah. M.E. Right. So your journey in life plus the value that you're able to acquire through that journey in life allows you to be able to have the money and the most importantly, to get the experience of having the money in life. That's, that's powerful. I like, I mean, I have, I haven't had a chance to read the book yet. I, I would love to have read it before you came on. Sure. But... I'll send you a copy, Joe. Don't worry about it. <laughs> all right. All right. I'll, uh, and see if I can get Anna to see my address. Okay. So journey plus value equals uh me money equality is that right money and experience money, money and, and experience. experience yes sir that's uh that's powerful because the journey that you know so many times people are looking at the end game and i still haven't heard you hit that and i don't know if that's going to be like number three but i i see you saying level based game and then i see you talking about sharing 
networking and then reaching backwards. I still haven't heard you talking about actually getting to the end. But then when you start talking about your your uh, your book, it's like journey and journey is huge. My dad would always tell me the greatest, the most important part of your tombstone is the dash in between the years. You know, everybody has a born day. Everybody has a death day. And even if that day is the same day, which would be horrible because we're talking about a little baby. But the, the greatest experience is what happens in the small dash. That's what tells the story. That's what people will remember you for. The part that is overlooked is what sets. That is the legacy. That That's is correct. what the young people will be groomed to you know it's like we think uh, in in america we think about uh in the states we think about mlk jr you know one of my heroes you know i think about my mother you know one of my heroes you know i think about daddy madison one of my heroes but it's not so much i thank god that they were born you know and i and my mother's still alive with me and but i thank god that i, I wish that they weren't dead i could be i could maybe i could speak with them but it was what happened while they were alive that left the impression on my heart and changed me in so many ways. So for you to say it's the journey plus the value is like, hey, write that down. You need to remember this. This is important. This is like really important, you know. So what is number three? You hit the nail on the head, Joe. Number three is the experience. So you, you say something so valuable, and that is understanding your experience is what your legacy becomes, right? So when somebody understands what their experience in life is, now everyone has different experiences. Everyone has a different approach to their experience. Some of us can be more self-fulfilling with our experience process. You know, we want to get wealthy so we can do the things we want to do. We can not necessarily be under anybody's thumb. We can do, you know, live the life we want to live. And then you have some some other folks who want to be, ex, who want to experience the opportunity to help people to leave a mark. And I I would use some, you know, use some other names out there. Some that we even have living today, a Jeff Bezos. Right, Jeff Bezos was able to create a product or a platform that will be here long after he's gone. You know, uh, we look at other individuals who are able to put things in place. Uber, you know, another guy who I believe his name is um, Kaudiki is his last name. And he's a guy who revolutionized the transportation industry simply by allowing the common man with the vehicle to have the opportunity to make a living for themselves. Right. Right. So there's so many of us out there. And I, I believe this. I said this in one of my YouTube channel uh, videos the other day. I said, every one of us, there's 7 billion people on this earth. And for every seven, for every single person, we have identical, we have, might have identical characteristics in the sense that we all bleed red. Uh, we might all have, you might even have a set of twins with completely identical features from the nose, the face, to every little detail. But what separates them is either their fingerprint or their footprint. So there's still something that separates each person that kind of makes their way through this earth or this journey of life that we go through. So what that also tells me is each of us have different thought patterns that we can bring something into this world. And that experience is what we miss in this world. That's why, you know, the common saying is the graveyard is the wealthiest place on earth. Hmm. It's not because there's so many people dead in the graveyard, but because there's so many ideas that were never realized. There were so many things that we never got to experience because some of us took that experience with us and went to the grave with that. So my third piece is the experience that we allow the world to enjoy with us. And that's what makes life a full, complete circle. Mm. Yeah, that's, uh, that's powerful. That's powerful. You know, um, you know, I, I feel that. And I think that that's, you know, a, a piece of that, especially that you said, I think that it's, it's necessary living in the presence you know being presently minded you know understanding that this is the day that you have there will never be another day like this make the best out of that day with what you have in that day 
how on earth did you become so positive with all that you have been through? Now, believe it or not, Joe, it was never the case. Um, when I left <laughs> at 16 years old, I had a chance to get out of the school. And through my experience in the school, all I thought about was the world hated me. I had this negative ex mindset. I hated the world. I came out with so much rage. Um, I wanted to just, you know, I had this approach of, you know, fight. It was, I, when people say fight or flight, I never, I didn't think flight was an option. It was always fight, right? My thought process was kill or be killed. Doggy dog world, take what you can. And as I got through my life, my journey, my mother ended up having cancer at 30, when I was 30 years old. And when she had cancer, she was a very religious woman, believed in the Lord, uh, she was an evangelist. You know, my book talks about an experience that I had with her where she stood up in the middle of a bus stop one time in the, on the bus and started preaching to everyone. I was very embarrassed by it, but that was how much she believed in the Lord. She always wanted to share the message. She would pray in public places and loud prayers for everybody to know she was praying. And that was the kind of person she was. So when she had cancer, it was like I felt that God was punishing her from because of me and my thought process. So it even made me have more hatred towards everything that was religion, Christianity. It made me have more hatred towards humanity. And in 2019, I faced some very, very, very tragic adversity. My marriage ended. I was married at the time. And in January, my wife and I divorced. My ex-wife and I divorced. In February, I had a business, a liquor store business, that I wasn't intelligent enough to know that you can get defrauded from a business. So I lost my entire business, over $60,000 in inventory, plus my real estate that I owned uh, to a fraudulent buyer. And then in April, I lost my mother. My mother passed away. So uh -huh. after she passed away, I remember seeing her body and I remember thinking to myself that, wow, this world is so quick. Our time here is not guaranteed. And I had a choice to make. You know, when I buried my mom, and that's something my book talks about too. I remember when I went to the morgue, my mom had to stay in the morgue for three months because I couldn't even afford to bury her. I had negative $224.14 in my account when my mom passed away. My girlfriend at the time, and she's still my girlfriend now, helped me with paying for a Spirit Airline plane ticket that I had to fly with no, no luggage. As you know, Spirit doesn't let you get on. You have to pay for any bags you take on. So I had to fly just with what I had on because it cost $50 to go and $35 to come back. And then my uncles picked me up. So I didn't have any way. I had nothing. And I just kept thinking I was upset with my mom for dying, as silly as and as crazy as that sounded, because I felt that she should have waited till maybe I had a little bit of money in my pocket to be able to bury her. But when I saw her body, it did something to me. It was like a light bulb came on, right? I understood something. I understood that the path I had been on had been a path of destruction. And that path was only going to lead to something worse. And I also understood that one day, it will be my turn to lay in the box like she, she was, right? Ooh. And I only had one thought to make, and that was change who I was. So the first decision I made, Joe, was I said I was never going to be broke again. I made that decision there and then. And it was like, no matter what I had to do, of course, legal. I wasn't going to do anything illegal. But no matter what I had to do, I was going to promise myself I was never going to be broke again. And it's so powerful when you make a decision, Joe. When you make a decision like that, I can't explain what it does to you, but it just, it gives me goosebumps talking about it now because I still remember the way that felt. This was three years, less than three years ago, right? I just remember that feeling and saying, this would never be me again. And since then, I've been so blessed. I've closed multi-million dollar deals. I've worked with, you know, multi-million dollar individuals. I've actually created and seen multi-million dollar projects that are paying me passive income that gives me the ability to have these conversations. And Joe, this is in a span of three years. So what I'm saying is there are people out there that can do the same thing. Yes. You know, I'm not special at all. There's nothing about me that's special. If anything, if a person like me with the kind of mindset that I had and the negative mindset, the anger and the trauma could be in this position, then I 
don't see how somebody else can have that same experience. Bravo, brother. Bravo. That that's huge. You know, and my I, I talk about my dad a lot, I guess, especially on the show with you. But my dad, he would always he would always tell me, he would always tell me, Lafayette Jenkins, he would always tell me that uh, you know, God will bring a man even to his deathbed to have him to realize that he is real. And so it like it always stuck with me that you know God will go through he'll go through hell or high water as we would say you know to help somebody because all things work together for good and not that the things that you were going through you know I would consider those things to be good I mean this talk talk about stress you know wife business real estate mom I mean, this is like this is like the atom bomb of man, you know, just one man receiving a bomb and your life's supposed to be destroyed. This sounds like the story of Job. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. This is like the story of Job, you know, just curse God and die right now. Because there's nothing else left for you. Just face it. He don't like you, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, and in the end of it, it's like you found something greater. And with one choice, one choice. I mean, that's what I'm hearing. One Absolutely. choice. You know, you saw your mom. And the way I take this is that you recognize the wealth inside of her, the lessons that were inside of her. And something inside of your heart just, that was it. It clicked and you made one choice. And it sent you onto a trajectory that brought you to this show today. Exactly. And the many people that you've helped now is all based off of that one choice. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, and it's beautiful that you say that because now when I experience any adversity, I make a movement and I, forgive me if I do it, but I do this. Right. And the reason I rock like this is for a reason. When you get on, a, when you ever see a boat and you get on the boat for the first time, it does that. It moves, you know, it kind of rocks back and forth. The reason why it does that is because it has to stabilize. And that's what God does for us, right? God makes our lives seem a little rocky because there is a calm coming. You just have to be able to withstand that calm, that slight, very slow storm, because then once you hit that calm, it's such a beautiful experience. You know, it's the money comes in the avalanches. You have the experience. I mean, I've got to travel first class, business class overseas. It's a whole different world, you know. I've got to meet billionaires. I've got to go to their homes, spend time with them. I've got to do deals with multimillionaires. I had a call today, this morning, with the guy who owns well over 3,000 acres of real estate. And we're looking at putting a solar farm in Texas. You know, and those leases pay you till you die. And my son would be able to benefit from those things. And when I think back to 2019, it just seemed like everything was rocking rocking but now it's the calm so what i'm saying is live through that storm right the storm would pass regardless but what happens in levels of the game back to what i meant by levels is if you don't allow yourself to experience that level and make it through that level you continuously repeat the process and sometimes it creates a situation where we repeat the process over over and over and then we get a little too old and now we don't even have the power to fight anymore and we give up. So I'm so appreciative to have a chance to talk with you, Joe. I think this is, you know, beautiful. Um, I love what you do. You know, again, this is great. Just telling people it starts with me. It's, it's, it's just amazing. Man, I am appreciative. I am appreciative that you are on this show. I have absolutely enjoyed everything everything man i've enjoyed you we have got to stay in touch and we want you back sure we, thank we, you we want you back 100 listen we're about to close on now is there anything that you would like to leave with the audience sure sure the only thing i'll leave again is just back to what i said remember at the end of the day a pregnant woman's greatest moment of joy comes right after her greatest pain you know the process of childbirth causes so much pain and right after that you have the most beautiful experience you can have so no matter what you're going through in life folks just go through it because your pain 
becomes your why and your why gives you your experience. Beautifully said, beautifully said. Excellent. Casey Oyinya, did I say it yes, right? Sir. Yes, sir. Ah. Right. All right. Thank you very much once Thank again you, for being on the show with us. You all go to Amazon and uh, find this book, M.E., Money Experience. Thank you, brother. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Joe. Listen, what I I knew it. I could feel it. As soon as I started talking to him, I was like, this guy is going to be amazing. I didn't even get into a deep conversation like I, I have done with some of the individuals that come on. I just felt it from the very start, felt like a brother. And uh, he left a lot of good. Remember, he's a man of empathy, uh, connection, gratefulness. And he left certain sayings like, you are not defined by your circumstances. Adversity comes at every level of life. You got to either rise or you fall to it. But why not rise? Because when you let pain become your why, then that can then become your victory. And live through the storm because there's a calm that comes after it. And he's living in that calm and prospering in that calm. And so should you. Remember, no matter where you are, no matter how you're viewing or listening to this, it starts with you just much as it starts with me. Peace.